Hi, hey, this is Bernie Thompson. Uh, I'm here with Paul Raffleson, who's the executive director of the Online Merchants Guild, uh, which is an organization uh, that uh, advocates and speaks on behalf of small sellers uh, in some of the big tough issues of the day. And one of those uh, tough issues, kind of the lead issue for the Online Merchants Guild is sales tax. Um, sales tax is this you know, really uh, interesting, if you're into accounting and tax area, um, where kind of the, um, you know, the history of, of states taxing transactions locally is, is kind of on a collision course with e-commerce um, where, you know, anybody at their kitchen table can sell a product, uh, you know, anywhere in the country. Uh, and we're all doing taxes uh, this time of year. And, and uh, you know, it's uh, if if sales tax goes the wrong way, um, you know, we could have all that paperwork that we're doing right now, you know, be multiplied by you know, up to 50, up to 50 different states. There's actually only 45 that have sales tax, right, Paul? But, That's right. But don't forget the income taxes and all the other administrative fees involved with being registered in the state. It, it, it's, it's exponential, 10,000 jurisdictions total. Yeah. So, so potentially, you know, it's this massive issue that's been completely unresolved. And, and most of those kind of kitchen table e-commerce sellers or small companies, you know, are not dealing with it, even though the states, uh, kind of would want them to. And this is coming to a head in various ways, including a case that's actually in front of the Supreme Court right now, uh, between the state of South Dakota and uh, a company called Wayfair. Can you give us a kind of an introduction to, to that? case, Paul, and, and uh, you know, how did it get started and, and what's at stake with the case? Sure. Uh, you know, the case goes actually back uh, a ways, back to 2015. Um, it's a case uh, involving Wayfair, actually Overstock and Newegg uh, are part of it too. Uh, Wayfair is the, the, the lead in, in the case. Uh, and basically, if you take a little bit of a look back in time, there was a case called Direct Marketing. Uh, a case that technically didn't really have to do with tax itself, uh, had to do with uh, whether a federal court could hear something that was sort of related to a tax. I won't get into that. Uh, in in the, uh, the opinion, uh, Justice Kennedy, in a concurring opinion, made a pretty uh, strong, I don't know the word, a little bit of a tirade uh, about the Quill rule, the, what they call the physical presence rule. A lot of people on Amazon and eBay certainly are very familiar with that rule. Uh, and saying how outdated that was effectively and, and you know, that there needs to be a case brought to the court so that they can basically overrule it because it's, it's sort of an archaic rule. Uh, and so that got the states to sort of pass these blatantly unconstitutional under current physical presence rules, economic nexus uh, laws. And so, you know, if you have a threshold of if you pass a certain number of sa amount of sales, you're deemed to have nexus. And I think South Dakota had one of the lowest amounts. And they did that pretty much to get the case going. I mean, that's typically when there's a big case that states want to address, they typically take action to target a taxpayer and make it the, the, the case. So Quill, for example, uh, is a perfect example that the Quill case that created the physical presence rule or sort of solidified the physical presence rule uh, was, was a product of the states sort of picking a picking a, a poor company to go after. And their first pick actually settled, didn't, didn't just said, we'll pay the tax. And so their second on the list was Quill, right? So they ended up bringing that Quill case up. But um, so that, that's sort of the history of how we got there. So, so, so Kennedy invited the case, the states passed these unconstitutional tax laws, Wayfair challenged it, uh, eventually went to the South Dakota Supreme Court. South Dakota basically said at the Supreme Court, we are, you know, this is unconstitutional basically wanting the South Dakota Supreme Court to rule against it so that it could then bring the case before the Supreme Court. And uh, the court uh, early January decided that they're going to hear the case and it's going to be heard April 17th, which I believe is the tax day uh, this year. It's typically April 15th, but uh, something it was April 17th this year. And I'm wondering if the court had a bit of a sense of humor uh, when they decided to hear the tax case, which they typically don't like tax cases uh, on tax day. So that's so, how we got here. Well, great. Okay, so that's a good history. So now, what what's at stake? Uh, you know, so you know, the Supreme Court, you know, issues a ruling, and uh, you know, it's it's generally kind of in favor of one side or the other. I mean, there can be a lot of subtlety in that, but but in in kind of general terms, if if the Wayfair case goes the wrong way for the small e-commerce seller, what does the world look like uh, in that case? Uh, you know, that's that's it. I mean. 
the way, I mean, if you look at the online merchant skill, I mean, just kind of to, 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 to address your point, but it, our, our organization started because of this tax. I mean, that was sort of the catalyst. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. That's where the, you know, people I was speaking to who had the tax issue said, why don't we have a trade association for Amazon merchants to cover what's important for Amazon merchants? And right now tax would have been that thing that we would have been covering. So that's what sort of led to the creation of the organization. Uh, because this is an existential threat. Uh, unless you're among the really large sellers or merchants, uh, your tax compliance cost could be a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, God knows. But people think about sales tax, well, it might just be a couple grand a year to file a few tax returns quarterly. But where this is going is that you also have to file income tax returns. People forget about income tax returns, but if you have an LLC uh, or an S Corp, it's most likely your S Corp or LLC will have to file a, um, if it's a pass through a 1065 and this federally, and then they're gonna file a state version of that 1065 in every state uh, that, that has some sort of income tax and divide up, show how their income's divided up in every state. Uh, and then they have to flow that through to their personal income tax return, which they also have to file in every state. And so you're gonna be filing two returns at least in every state plus some we call k1 statements i mean the tally it gets pretty expensive those are not cheap those are not 20 to 30 dollars a return i mean sales tax returns in some instances are really easy you just put a, a number and you just mail it in uh some states are a little bit more difficult when you have to go jurisdiction by jurisdiction but still even that compared to income tax return compliance is much more expensive and i think you know, $500, I'm not sure I would trust the accountant who charges $500 these days for something that complicated, but uh, on the on the lowest of sides, and I think $1,000 or more per state is what you could be looking at um, yeah. just in terms of that compliance. So so basically, you know, in the Wayfair case, if the if the uh, Supreme Court rules in, in favor of South Dakota, really the, the the that old quill standard that you even had to have a substantial nexus uh, is going to be weakened or, or you know, kind of wiped out. And, and states can uh, really go after any uh, company in any other state who is you know selling online and has customers in in this case, South Dakota. Is is that a correct characterization? Yes and no. I mean, yes, it, it certainly weakens what the court thinks of substantial nexus. And, uh, you know, the court can rule in favor of South Dakota in, in a bunch of ways. They can rule in favor of Wayfair in a bunch of ways. And really, it's sort of the subtleties of what they say that kind of leads them to the ruling that might make the biggest of differences. But, you know, absolutely, if the court rules in favor of Wayfair and they say, you know, physical presence is no longer the substantial nexus problem, it, it, it was in uh um, back in the day, or physical presence no longer is needed because not having a physical presence and, and a burden on interstate commerce really aren't correlated, right? When physical presence was decided, we're talking 1992. We're talking case facts that went back even before that. This is pre-internet, right? Now the states are saying to the court, it's so easy to comply with all these systems, right? Deliberately not mentioning the income tax, uh, deliberately bringing a case against companies like Wayfair and Newegg, not mentioning the fact that they're also trying to seek the same tax from, you know, people at their kitchen table. Uh, so, so it's sort of uh, concerning that if the court sort of takes what the, what the, what the states are saying, uh, that it is easy to comply now, uh, and that physical presence, and, and so the rule that physical presence is not needed, the nexus threshold can be much lower, um, that would be bad because that would pretty much give the states free reign to sort of do whatever they want and put the sellers in, or the merchant sellers, whatever you want to call it, put us in another situation where we have to take further action to protect our rights, which may happen anyway. I mean, it's just, it's the case really isn't focused on us. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about later what we wrote, what I wrote and what we wrote and what the guild submitted and why, how we brought yeah. that focus in. Well, so yeah, let's talk about that. So, so, you know, one of the, one of the challenges here is you've got these really big entities, states and, you know, big marketplaces like Amazon, uh, you've got Supreme Court cases. It's really hard for anybody to keep in mind the impact on the hundreds of thousands, actually in low millions of e-commerce businesses. You know, these are these are families and small companies, you know, that rely on selling stuff nationally, you know, who, uh, you know, could be wiped out by this because of the, you know, this kind of overwhelming paperwork burden. Um, so individually, these, you know, all all the e-commerce sellers, you know, kind of like, 
you know, what do you do? There's all these big companies, and that's the whole purpose of the Online Merchants Guild um, is to be is to represent uh, for all of those small uh, entrepreneurial uh, companies here that that sell online in the U.S. So, uh, so you filed a, an amicus brief, uh, a friend of the court filing, kind of speaking uh, for the Online Merchants Guild, and and doing that speaking for these small companies. Um, so what, uh, what was, you know, what's in that amicus brief? What did, what should, what did small companies really need to tell the court that the court didn't know, uh, about this situation and, and the importance of this, um, decision going the right way? Sure. So, you know, this case is, uh, this case was brought against Wayfair, Newegg and Overstock. I don't know about you, but I could pretty much guess that you probably, you know, I, I don't know what you think, but I, I can pretty much guess that the court is going to have very little sympathy uh, to the idea that Overstock might have to file 50 state tax returns. I don't think we're going to feel too bad for a multi-billion dollar company like Overstock or Newegg having to do that. And so what the court needed to know and hear about was the the scope beyond that, you know, and that's where we come in, right? That this isn't just about huge billion dollar companies. This is about their ability to assert nexus over all sorts of companies, you know, websites, you know, individual websites that don't sell on Amazon, uh, small businesses that have a ton of mail order uh, appeal, you know, that sell, sell a lot of goods by mail. I, I mean, a lot of amicus briefs, not just ours, focused on the impact of small businesses. In fact, Montana and New Hampshire submitted amicus briefs focusing on the impact of their small businesses, two states that don't have a sales tax. Uh, our, our brief is a little bit more tailored to the online merchant, not surprisingly. And the difference between our brief and I think the others that sort of hypothetically raised the, the concern is that we had actual facts, right? Because over the last six months, right, what the states have been doing, you know, California hunting down uh, small businesses, uh, you know, the amnesty program, which was a total sham, which is why I call it the shamnesty program and said so in the brief. Uh, is another example of, of, you know, states really taking this hardline enforcement effort against the small businesses and at the same time pointing out the sort of, well, wait a minute, um, why are you doing that when you could have just required Amazon to collect tax, which is the lion's share of the money that you're not getting. It's the lion's share of what you're telling the court is the problem, right, is the money you're not getting from Amazon. But you, Amazon has had Nexus, for example, what they call the, you know, the, the ability to tax or impose a the collection responsibility, Amazon's met that requirement, that substantial nexus threshold in California, probably back in 2010. They, they've had a Kindle division there, my understanding. And then in 2012, in September, I believe, uh, is roughly when they started collecting in California. So from that day forward, there was no reason why Amazon could not be collecting on its marketplace, which represents roughly half its sales. And so our point to the court was, look what the states are doing to, to, to small businesses even when they had the opportunity to, to make it really easy on them by not making them do it. Like they could have just asked Amazon to, or told Amazon to collect. They could have changed the law if they felt that was necessary. Whatever it was, they had, they have avenues to close the, to, to close the gap of, you know, what they can't collect and what they're owed and also to level the playing field. I mean, Amazon is viewed as a big contributor to this retail Armageddon apocalypse uh, situation. We hear about, uh, president talks about it. Uh, you know, and if you really look at it, you, the question is, well, did the states kind of facilitate that? I mean, is it kind of ironic that they're telling the courts that they're trying to fix it, but maybe had they done what they were supposed to do, which is require retailers with nexus in the state to collect tax, maybe they would have helped stop it? Well, so yeah, and kind of on that point of, uh, you know, kind of other ways that are less burdensome uh, to small business and to the overall economy, uh, you know, we've got two examples now of states you know, that have asked Amazon to collect for all transactions in the state. And, you know, what's interesting is, you know, Amazon, this is an issue with Amazon. Amazon is actually complying with those two states. Uh, you know, uh, say a little bit about that. Yeah, right. And so, you know, first first thing in our brief is we have to identify, you know, we have to call call out the, you know, the state's contradictory statements. They're saying that they can reduce the burden. They're saying that, you know, they're here to fix a problem. And so we're calling that out. But then going to your point, okay, well, <clears throat> what else can we, what else can we tell the court? Because uh, it's not just about the states sort of acting, uh, you know, speaking out of both sides of their mouth. It's also about 
um, burdens on interstate commerce because at the end of the day, whatever the court decides has to do with the burden on interstate commerce. So it's the constitutional uh, foundation of, of these tax cases, right? Is, is, is making businesses do this going to be an undue burden on interstate commerce? Um, and so one of the things that was crucial to point out, especially with respect to who could collect. So like you said, if Washington changed their law because they felt that was necessary, uh, to make Amazon collect. South Carolina, on the other hand, is just saying our law as written requires you to collect, which tends to be where I come out on this situation personally. But either way, these are vehicles in which states can make Amazon collect, meaning the burden on the individual online merchant, which would be massive, versus the burden on Amazon, which would be really nothing. At the end of the day, they're already collecting in every state. And, and for a company that size, they're equipped to handle it. They have tax department of, I think they have the largest tax department in the country now. Now that GE is kind of no longer GE's tax department, my former, uh, or I used to be a tax, state tax litigator, uh, the, the, the whole Amazon structure is set up to collect tax in every state. So if the states have the ability to mitigate and not mitigating can destroy an industry then, and the mitigation, especially if the mitigation is reasonable, then they have to do it. We have case law out there that says you have to do it. It's not tax case law. It's just general interstate commerce burdens case law. In fact, uh, a, a case that the states bring up as a check on their ability to sort of live in a physical presence-free world is this case, Pike, Pike v. Bruce Church. And part of what we're saying is, yeah, the states are right. That is a good case in terms of needing to mitigate the burden on interstate commerce and making sure that it's in check. But as we can see today, right before your eyes, they're not doing that. Because again, they could have done that with Amazon. They could have required Amazon to collect for the past eight years, and they chose not to. Yeah, and so, so it's interesting that we've got you know two states, uh, Washington and, and Pennsylvania, that have passed marketplace laws um, that now, uh, instead of shifting this burden to small sellers, uh, have uh, placed the burden on the marketplace, like you said. Um, and you know what's interesting about it is you know so now the the states there are collecting you know close to 100 percent of the revenue on that marketplace, and also you know it's it's actually not bad for Amazon. Amazon, um, first of all, is on board with this. I mean, they've put together a program uh, to handle any of these states that pass these sorts of laws. You know, and then you know, it, it creates a, a, an interesting competitive moat for Amazon, which is if you're a seller and you're selling nationally, um, the, the states are going to you know, make an argument that you have to be filing tax forms in all the states. But if you restrict your sales uh, to these platforms uh, that are collecting or remitting the tax for you, and arguably it doesn't take away all the risk and burden and complexity because the you know there, there's there's gray areas out there but but basically it takes away the biggest part of your financial risk because Amazon is collecting and, and remitting on your behalf and so that creates a motivation to stay with the big marketplaces that can that can do the tax compliance and if I start selling on my own outside of Amazon I'm actually creating risk for myself so so it's interesting you know this uh, you know this this kind of yeah, somewhat ugly compromise um, that Washington and Pennsylvania have done, that Amazon has said yes to, that sellers generally like because it uh, you know, largely takes this very ugly issue off the table. It's actually kind of in everybody's interest, uh, and and but it's not the direction all states are going yet. I mean, that's only two out of forty-five states with sales tax. The rest of the states, including big ones like California, are not a, not at all aligned in this direction. So yeah, you oh, go ahead. No, 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 I'm saying it's interesting because you say the 45 states and it's, it's interesting because Jefferson County Parish, Louisiana. So Louisiana has like over 60 individual mini department of revenues in the state. So it's, it's not like you file one form and you, you, you list out by zip code where your sales were. You actually have to file separately and go to 60 different websites to electronically file your tax returns. And you can get audited by 60 different towns or parishes in Louisiana, technically. Now, they sued Walmart and basically just won a case arguing, just like South Carolina's arguing, Walmart is a retailer. But they're not doing it for Amazon, in my understanding, so which is a little odd, but it's it's there. I mean, the ability to require Amazon to collect and make it easy for merchants is there. Um, and yeah, I think it's in everyone's best interest, but um, the one thing to remember, though, is still, in Washington State, a lot of people don't know this, they still, there's there's something called the B&O tax, business and occupation tax, and there's a wholesale rate and a retail rate. And because Washington doesn't think you're a retailer for obvious reasons, uh, they consider you to be a wholesaler. And so they expect merchants still 
to remit a B&O tax, which is on you, uh, return, quarterly, monthly, whatever the requirement is, uh, they still expect merchants to do that. So again, they, in a way, it's sort of something we wrote, brought up to the court in our brief is to say, look, even Washington mitigated the burden by making Amazon collect on their sales tax, but they're still burdening interstate commerce because it's just another state requiring compliance with their B&O tax. And so again, it's it's just, it's never ending. And so yeah. yes, the sales tax is good, but we still have to focus on the income tax too. And that that isn't Amazon's responsibility. Uh, and that that's that's another issue. Yeah, and it's it's great to have an organization like the Online Merchants Guild, you know, that has the resources to have a you know former uh, tax attorney or, or a current tax attorney and former tax uh, director. I, I say, what were your roles? Actually, yeah, that, that's a good thing to do. You know, so here, yeah. here you are today. You're, you're executive director of the Online Merchants Guild, who's speaking for sellers. Sales tax is this huge issue that sellers cannot deal with on your own. What what what's your what's your background that you bring uh, to that role? Tell us a little bit about what you've done in tax over your career. Sure. Uh, so I used to work at H and R Block, and now I do this. <laughs> no, sorry, I couldn't resist tax season. Uh, no, uh, so I, you know, since I've been out of law school, I've pretty much been in tax litigation my whole career. Uh, uh, I spent couple of years out of law school at a firm, uh, I decided I had enough of New York and wanted to move to Florida and retire at the age of 25. So I did. Uh, and that lasted for about two years when I got brought to Microsoft, uh, very close to where literally the same office park where, where, where uh, um, Bernie is in, 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 in the Seattle area, uh, no longer there, unfortunately. But um, the, the, my role there was what they call tax controversy, which is the tax way of saying tax litigation. So, I mean, if it's responding to an auditor, if it's sitting with an auditor, if it's a, if it's if it's uh, administrative level appeals, uh, which are much less formal than going to court or formal litigation, suing a state, you know, state assessing a tax, paying the tax, suing the state for a refund, uh, any of those things pretty much fell on my shoulders. That's what I was responsible for. Uh, after a couple of years at Microsoft, uh, somebody had mentioned Walmart to me and said, okay, Walmart needs somebody. And I said, there's no way I'm ever moving to Arkansas. Are you crazy? About almost a year later, they said, "Real Walmart wants you to come back. And I said, all right, I'll take a look. So I went to Walmart, same exact role, in-house tax litigation, predominantly state and local, some federal, uh, but certainly working with a lot of states and, and not just handling the litigation. I mean, part of your role is to network with the government, is to go to you know, we go to functions that are, are you know, the governments have, con you know, the state tax officials have uh, conferences, you know, like regional conferences, national conferences, and they're open to the public. So we would we would go and mingle with the states and just sort of forge those relationships because those those relationships at the higher level were really important. So it, it's all part of what we did. And then um, after two years of Walmart, somebody reached out to me and said, General Electric needs somebody in, in Connecticut. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey. So. I know Connecticut very well. It's a school in Massachusetts. Uh, and I don't know what people know about General Electric and their tax department, but uh, according to the New York Times, when they were sort of calling out GE for paying zero tax, they also paid the tax department of GE the biggest compliment by saying they're basically the best tax law firm in the world. Uh, even though it's an in-house um, operation, GE was known for having the best tax lawyer. So getting sort of the call to say, hey, come to GE was like, okay, I'm getting the call to go to the Yankees. So uh, I went to I went to GE uh, and spent a number of years there and just learned in even another level, like another layer and level of, of tax controversy, uh, working with, with that company and working with some of the people who've been doing it the longest and have really forged um, some of the most creative ways to manage these issues. So fighting with states has been pretty much one of the things that I've done. I mean, most of what I've done for the last 10 years or 12 years, or how many, however many years it's been. And so... I feel like I probably, I guess this issue when it came up was really important to me because I knew that I knew it was wrong from the start. I knew how wrong the states were. Uh, and I just felt like, you know what, they're really bullying people at the end of the day. Like they, they're bullying, you know, the little guy, the way that they would try to bully Microsoft. The difference is if Microsoft has to spend a million bucks to litigate a case that's not even noticed, right? They don't even care. But for the average online merchant, you know, when people call me up and say, can you help me? I say, yeah, I can help you, but I can't litigate this case for you because you couldn't afford to do it. The reality is no, very few merchants 
could probably afford to litigate this case on their own. And so another reason why the online merchant skill is so important because it's like the case may need to be litigated. We may have to go to court. An amicus brief is great. And I think it was important that we filed it and that we um, had our voice heard or at least have the potential to have our voice heard. And hopefully it will. But if it doesn't work, we're going to have to take legal action. We have there are great opportunities we have to assert our rights to quickly put an end to sales tax, this nightmare, not just sales, income tax too. And we may have to do it, but that's it's not going to be cheap because the lawyers that we have to hire, right? I don't ever do anything by myself. I mean, litigation requires a lot of people. You need associates. You need, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of research and writing that goes into it. And, uh, and that's not free, unfortunately. So because of that, one of the reasons we form the association is so that people can join and, and, and pool their resources so that we can accomplish things for uh, for our merchants. And, you know, obviously our focus isn't going to be just tax right now. Tax is the most important thing. Um, but at the end of the day, it's going to be, you know, intellectual property, trade, uh, whatever the issues are, we're, we're looking into benefits. I mean, that's a big thing we want to provide is we want to build a benefits program because, you know, a lot of online merchants, well, they're all technically self-employed. Right. And so they don't have access to sort of the group level of benefits. And so we have a huge community. So let's leverage that size and build some benefits for our people, for our people, yeah. for our merchants. So, no, it's such, it's such a such a great mission, yeah. you know, d doing doing the things that the small guys can't do for themselves. And I love that, you know, that picture that you created there, you know, which is which is, a, you know, an interesting reality that I think a lot of us don't see, you know, which is they, they literally call the role uh, tax controversy. And, you know, that these big companies that operate nationally and the states are constantly, you know, jabbing and sparring with each other, you know, out of the courts, in the courts, um, you know, states levying, you know, sending letters, making demands, you know, companies kind of, you know, arguing back and, and fighting those. And, and but that dynamic breaks down when a state is doing that against small companies. Uh, companies you know when a when a mom and pop shop you know sitting in the, at at their residence you know receives this threatening letter from a state you've got no recourse i mean my, you know microsoft that would just be just another letter you know how are we going to respond to this okay well we'll push back this way we'll threaten them that way we'll you know we'll make this legal argument but for that uh for that husband and wife sitting there in the, in their kitchen there's nothing they can do nothing yeah no, it's Really sad. In fact, I always think Illinois, just, you know, sort of a perfect example. I mean, Illinois is makes me ill and they're very annoying. So Illinois. No, but uh, their state is really, really aggressive. I mean, they're hyper aggressive. If they have a 10 percent chance of winning, they will take the position against a big corporation and just grind you to a halt and just make it really, really hard to, to do anything. They just they just they, they leverage their bureaucracy. They they're relentless. Uh, auditors or lawyers are really aggressive. And so I've litigated some really, without lack of a better word, stupid cases. No, I can't, I can't believe you guys are trying to, to push this argument. But um, so I, I, I know that side of things. And, and in fact, Illinois is so bad, I, I sort of joke that whenever we go to tax conferences, because these things exist, a bunch of state tax nerds in the conference to that together, and Illinois is like the topic of conversation, I would say it sort of goes from like group strategy to group therapy, because everyone's just sort of emotionally sort of shell-shocked from having to deal with Illinois. Uh, and so when I see that, and I always think to myself, I always think to myself, I'm like, that's crazy, but they're doing it to Microsoft. Like, you know what, good for me, good for, good for, you know, they say the full employment act, you know, it's, 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 why should I complain? Uh, but I always did a always kind of wonder, Bernie, to your point, I said, you know, what if they ever started doing that to me though, as like Paul Rafelson, the person, not Paul Rafelson counsel for Microsoft, but Paul Rafelson, me, like what if states started doing that? And I always found that to be, a little bit concerning like what if and now that what if is actually a reality and that's yeah. that's scary to me um, but in, and, and what's the you know and what's the counterbalance to that i mean one of the one of the kind of inherent inherent principles that is really odd here is this is states around the country going after businesses that only are in one state actually physically you know like in terms of ownership and employees and and the ability to vote and influence so so if you're a seller sitting there you know in utah you know you've got 44 other states you know that are that are making demands on you 
Uh, you have no voting rights in those states. So those states have no motivation to kind of like be nice or be fair. In fact, there's actually probably a political benefit to being really aggressive with the out-of-state companies because, you know, exactly. you're, you know, you're potentially getting financial benefits for the states. But it, but it's an Armageddon situation if all the states are doing this to all their own small businesses, which is why it's great that in the Wayfair case, you actually do have now it's states without sales tax, but you've got a few states who are actually realizing that, wow, in this ugly world where you know states are making these demands on all of uh, America's entrepreneurs all over to file you know 45 or 50 states worth of tax forms, that's going to you know impact all the entrepreneurs in my state, and so they're actually weighing in on the side of the small company, uh, you know, in the Wayfair case. Uh, that was really interesting to me. I actually didn't know that two of the states had weighed in that way. Yeah, it's it's um, you're exactly right. I mean, the states see the opportunity, right? I mean, Amazon does do a lot of capital investment in a lot of states. There's a lot of promise of future capital investments. It's the biggest company in the world. They're trying to build out a huge distribution network and all sorts of other ambitious goals, right? Do you want to sort of put another tax burden on Amazon? Maybe, maybe Amazon likes to have a tax advantage over local retailers, certainly something that they've spoken openly about in the past. So I'm not saying anything that's that's hasn't been said before. I think Brad Stone from Bloomberg wrote a whole book on it. Uh, I think there was a whole chapter in his book, Everything Store, dedicated to tax. Uh, so so maybe the state's being aware of that. Say, OK, well, listen, we're not going to bother Amazon. Let's go. Let's go pick on some online merchants, by the way, who are all out of state because uh, most online merchants do collect in their home state, even though technically if you read the law, they don't have to because they're not retailers by law. But forget that for a moment. To be safe, they typically collect in their home state. So they're thinking, OK, let's go after some out-of-state merchants. And I sort of said from the game, I said, well, you know what? If you're one of these amnesty states, because that's exactly what's going on, right? If you're one of these amnesty states and you're basically condoning other states coming into your state just so you can go into their state, I mean, that's kind of sick. And you kind of need to sort of people need to hold their if you are in a state that's participating in amnesty, you need to hold your elected representatives responsible for sort of allowing uh, other states to come in and, and sort of making that trade so that they can go get it. And I always, you know, I, I was in Honolulu, believe it or not, I was some really amazing online merchants based out of Hawaii uh, who were really, really political and really aggressive and had a meeting with the attorney general's office in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, I had people there from, you know, merchants who were with me. Uh, it was pretty amazing stuff and probably, you know, responsible for hiring I don't know, 100 people. It is crazy. Just And that's just two of them. And there's a lot more merchants in Hawaii than you realize. And, and one of the ones I was with, you know, I think they use about two tons of cocoa butter from another producer. And it's just amazing that how much they contribute to the economy to make their product and sell it across the country. And so, you know, I said, you know, we do this presentation. I need to post the presentation. It's really funny. Uh, but we did this presentation to the attorney general's office and we're trying to explain, like, listen, at the end of the day, if you're going to let California and Washington push these two, two merchants and everyone liked them out of business, right? A couple of things are going to happen. One, they're going to go out of business. So the economy is already hurting, right? The, the butter from Maui, the cocoa, the coconut butter, whatever it is, is not being purchased, the two tons of it, right? But the other thing's going to happen is they're going to have to lay off all these people. So who's going to pay for that? Because California and Washington don't pay their unemployment. California and Washington don't have to pay their benefits out when they, don't, when they can't get a comparable job. It's Hawaii. And so we've been trying to get that message. It's been a difficult message to kind of get across because, again, I think people just aren't familiar with how what it's like to be an online merchant. So education is a big part of it. Uh, and it's not that they shut us out. It's just the process of educating. Well, uh, and states that, I, I think people think it's a zero sum game like, oh, if everybody has to bear this burden, you know, then, OK, well, maybe it'll tilt the playing field to big guys, but whatever. I mean, the jobs will still be there. But it, but actually, it's it's that, that's a misunderstanding of the playing field because e-commerce is not just national. This isn't just a problem of national no, e-commerce clotting. It's global. And so, you know, can, will the, you know, Will the state of Florida or the state of Utah or the state of Pennsylvania be able to go after an e-commerce seller out of China? And Absolutely the answer not. is no, not without any kind of federal support for which there is none right now. And so what will happen if you tilt the playing field is not only will it put the small guy out of business and maybe shift those jobs to some big guys in the United States. That's not what is primarily going to happen. What's primarily going to happen is it's going to shift the jobs overseas because those overseas sellers will, will be able to bypass the U.S. states because they're unreachable by the states. Absolutely. Um, 
so yeah, I think there's some there's some assumptions that this will all work out, even though it's really ugly. But but it's not the case. We we really actually need to fight for kind of a, a right, fair system that that everyone can and does comply with, uh, rather than an unrealistic system um, that burdens certain groups more than others, and and you know actually doesn't in the end achieve the compliance they're looking for anyway. And I'm glad the you know I'm glad Paul that you're there with the Online Merchants Guild as a tax expert fighting for this. Um, it's great uh, to, to have an amicus brief filed. We didn't get to talk about a lot of the details in the amicus brief, but we'll post a, a link to that, uh, you know, right at the bottom uh, here of the of the interview. And then, um, you know, so if somebody wants to kind of beat you in person, get to talk to you, ask you some questions, uh, you're speaking at a conference at the end of this month, April 26th in New York City, the uh, the Seller Velocity Conference. Is 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 that right? What are you, you going to be... Uh, speaking on there at the conference? So yeah, so Seller Velocity Conference is a conference being held in New York City. Uh, that's, it's probably, I, I've never seen a collection of more just like powerful knowledge, be, like, like just total knowledge powerhouses for lack of a better word. I mean, they're just unbelievable experts. And, and I don't like, not that I'm saying that I'm one, I, I, I try to be humble, but uh, you know, certainly it's a great opportunity for people to, to meet a lot of experts and certainly I'll be there. And, you know, I always love meeting merchants. I mean, I think anyone I've ever met in person knows that I just I, I love trying to be open and, and talk to whomever. I think it's really cool that people have an interest in state tax. I mean, could you imagine what it was like to go to a party before this happened and tell people you're in state and local tax? I mean, you just now all of a sudden you become the life of the party. It's kind of cool, to be honest with you. But um, so, no, I, I love speaking to people and I, and I love the stories and, and I love the stories, but I love hearing the stories because they're very important for me because they remind me why I'm doing it. Why am I writing this amicus? What's fueling me to write it in a certain way is because of that. So I, I would really love for people to come to sellervelocitycoference.com. Um, a lot of, you know, if you have intellectual property concerns, uh, we have Casey Vaughn. You got Vern Francis, and you may not know him. He's a former senior IP counsel for Microsoft. I mean, the guy was practically doing, I think he was doing work for Bill Gates. I mean, the guy, you can talk about, you know, knowledge of intellectual property law. This guy is is, is up there in terms of experience, and, and he's going to be there for, for merchants to meet, ask questions. He's going to be speaking on important topics. Um, and so uh, just just really amazing people. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm going to be there and talking to you have full disclosure. So, I th you know, thank you for uh, <laughs> saying the people there would be amazing. So great. Yeah. Okay. So we, we that was, uh, you know, lots of great information. Thank you so much for your work, Paul, on behalf of small sellers with the online merchants guild. And uh, again, we'll, we'll have kind of for anybody who's interested in, in deeper information, we'll have links here uh, at the bottom, both to the amicus brief on the Wayfair case and to the seller velocity conference. Uh, if you'd like to meet Paul in person and ask questions and, and, you know, for your own business, kind of what to do given this kind of uncertain situation uh, with, with tax. Uh, and of course, to get involved with the online merchant skill because we uh, sellers need to get involved um, so that we can have this voice um, that will speak for all of us uh, in this kind of um, world of, of, uh, of big entities like states and stuff that, that otherwise uh, will drown us out. So thanks so much for, for talking today, Paul. We'll, we'll, see, you soon. Back. we'll, we'll see you April 26th at the Seller Velocity Conference. April 26th. Looking forward to it. Okay, Take great. Care. Okay, thanks, Paul. Bye. Bye-bye.